Good morning, and welcome to the February 2nd, 2022 meeting of the House Education Finance Committee. I'm Chair Representative Jim Davney. Remote hearings are held in accordance with House Rule 10.01. This rule has been posted and is linked to in our public notice on the House website. All remote hearings will be recorded and live streamed by House Public Information Services. Members, you have the contents of your virtual packets available and for the public, these same materials have been posted online. Members, if you're looking for all these items in one place, they are attached to the calendar event you have received uh, from Ms. Burt. To get on the list to be recognized by the chair, members using the Zoom interface have the ability to raise their hand via the app. I'd like to start with ro a roll call and member introductions. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Wilson Lee, the committee legislative assistant to the K-12 education finance team. Uh, if Mr. Lee, if you would please uh, take the role and give members a moment to introduce themselves after their name is called and share what school districts they represent. Mr. Lee. Thank you, Chair Dabney. Um, I'd like to start off with you, Chair Dabney. Thank you, Representative Jim Dabney. I represent the Minneapolis Public School District. Thank you. Rep Sandstead. Good morning, President. And what school districts do you represent, Representative Sandsteed? Thank you, Chair Daphne. I represent District 6A, so I've got many of the school districts across the Iron Range, Hibbing, Chisholm, Nashua, Kewatin, Big Fork, Effie, um, Floodwood. All right. All right, uh, Rep. Cresha. Representative Ron Cresha, uh, hello all in Little Falls, Minnesota. I represent 13 school districts in the Morrison and Todd County area. Thank you. Rep. Vice. Present. Um, I am uh, represent District 41B, which has three school districts. They are the Mounds View School District, where my kids are in fourth and sixth grade, as well as the St. Anthony New Brighton School District and the Columbia Heights School District. Rep. Jordan. Hi there, uh, my name is Representative Sydney Jordan. I represent 60A, which is Northeast Minneapolis and Southeast Como, and I am proud and honored to represent Minneapolis Public Schools. Rep. Marcourt. Uh, Representative Marcourt, present, and I represent uh, 11 school districts in Clay, Norman, and Becker counties, and I have taught and still am teaching 38 years at Dilworth Lindenfeld. Good morning. Chair Richardson. Good morning, uh, Richardson present, and I represent independent school districts 196, 197, and 199, which includes um, Mendota Heights, West St. Paul, Egan, Invergrove Heights, uh, and uh, Rosemont. Rep. Walgamot. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Dan Walgamot from District 14B, and I'm very proud to represent the St. Cloud District 742 and also the Sock Rapids District 47. Rep. Shung. I represent Representative Zhang here. Good morning. I represent ISD 622 and ISD 833 in the uh, first ring East Metro suburbs here. Rep. Yuo Kim. Thank you, President. I represent the school districts of Hopkins and St. Louis Park, which I've been proud to work in as a para over the years. And Hopkins Schools is where our three kids um, graduated and my husband teaches at. So thank you. Thank you students for being here today. Rep. Thompson. Rep. John Thompson, uh, District 67A. And I am honored to represent District 625, which is St. Paul Public Schools and all of our scholars uh, at uh, St. At St. Paul Public Schools. Thank you so much. Sir. Rep. Bennett. Oh, sorry about that. I couldn't get unmuted. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, I represent Albert Lee. 
my largest school district, but then also Glenville, Alden, Blooming Prairie, and Hayfield school districts. Rep. Daniels. Thank you, uh, Representative Daniels, District 24B. I have a, a Fairwell Public Schools and surrounding. I've got Morristown, Medford, a charter school at Nearstrand, and uh, I know I'm forgetting the one, but uh, I have all those smaller surrounding towns around Fairwell, and uh, they're just a great group of people to work with. And, um, looking forward to the discussion today. Rep. Damouf. I am Representative Lisa Damoth, representing Dis District 13A. I have six school districts. Those are Recori, Painesville, Avon, Eden Valley, Kimball, and part of St. Cloud District um, because I represent the city of St. Joseph. Thank you. Looking forward to our committee. Rep. Dovkowski. Good morning, everybody. Steve Draskowski. I um, represent House District 21B, where you will find uh, numerous school districts um, and uh, uh, kids and their families that uh, go to schools in public, charter, uh, parochial, and home schools. Rep. Erickson. Uh, Sandra Erickson, present, uh, representing District 15A. And my school districts are found in three different counties. In Sherburne, I have Elk River, primarily the Zimmerman District. And then moving uh, north, Princeton, Malacca, Onamia, Isle, and in Canaba County, Ogilvie, and Mora. Uh, I am glad to be here and welcome to the students. Rep. Mueller. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Representative Patricia Mueller, representing 27B. I have uh, I have five different school districts in my in my area, but I also have students that go to two other schools that are outside of my district. I represent Lyle, Pacelli, Grand Meadow, Southland, Leroy, and Lyle um, in Austin, obviously. I was a teacher in Austin for uh, five years as well, but it was a public school where I was a teacher for almost 17, almost 20 years in my, in my uh, tenure as a, as a teacher. I do have students um, that go to Stewartville. Uh, they uh, live in Racine and also that go to Hayfield as are my Brownsdale kiddos go to Hayfield. Super excited to be listening to our students and special welcome to our Austin ALC students as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Lee. Yeah, that makes uh, for 17 members present. Outstanding, we have a quorum. Thank you all for that. Uh, Representative Sandsteed, uh, next item on our, oh, excuse me. I skipped over something I certainly shouldn't have. Uh, to Hold on. Let me um, shift from these introductions just for a brief overview uh, for members and for the public. The House Education Finance Committee is staffed by a number of remarkable individuals. Our house research team, nonpartisan research, consists of Tim Strom, Christina Parra, and Solveig Beckel, our fiscal analyst. Our revisor is Cassandra McGinnis. Our house public, public information coordinator is Chris Carpentier. The house DFL caucus staff are Sarah Burt, the committee administrator, Mars Beltrandi Rudquist, our researcher, and Wilson Lee, the committee legislative assistant. The House GOP research staff for this committee is Jody Withers. Thank all of those staff for their work for the committee and the members. Now, Representative Sandsteed, I trust you've had a chance to review the minutes from our April 27th, 2021 meeting. If so, would you please move their approval? Good morning, Mr. Chair. I have indeed had the opportunity to review the minutes from April 27 and so move them. Thank you very much, Representative Sandsteed. Members, this is a uh, a voice vote, so if you would simply uh, unmute. All those in favor of the Sandsteed motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you all. So members, before we begin uh, committee testimony today, I feel compelled to acknowledge the horrific shooting 
at the South Education Center in Richfield yesterday that resulted in the death of one student, the critical injuries to another, and unimaginable trauma and stress to the students, staff, and families uh, there. District 287 has done deep and effective work over the years, developing innovative ways to keep their students and staff safe. We currently know little about what happened yesterday or who was involved in yesterday's shooting. While our thoughts and prayers are necessary, they're not sufficient. But for today, I wish to offer those. Thank you. Members, as is the practice of this committee, we like to start out each biennium by listening to the voices of students from across Minnesota. Uh, the virtual nature of committee work these days uh, is not my first choice, but it actually, uh, the advantage is it does facilitate the participation of individuals from across the state uh, in a, a much more conducive way than asking everyone to drive to St. Paul. So I do appreciate that. And we do have, uh, as Representative Mueller uh, already acknowledged, we do have students from a number of different districts and alternative learning centers here today from around the state. The students were asked to respond to two questions. What are the most urgent things you feel like you and your peers need from your school communities right now? And secondly, what do you feel like you need to prepare you for the challenges and opportunities that await you when you graduate? Now, to the students, a brief uh, word about the practice of, of this committee and other legislative committees. These committer, committee hearings are taped, uh, not just Zoom, but are taped and those tapes are then sent to the Minnesota Historical Society. So in 20 years, if you wanna remember what you said here today, you can go to the Historical Society and they will be able to pull the tape of this hearing. In order to facilitate people taking full advantage of these historical records, we ask each of you to uh, identify yourself by name before you uh, begin speaking. I'll call on you. I'll try to get your name right. My apologies uh, up front now. If I butcher your name, feel free to correct me, but I will call on you. You will then identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. If you don't get it quite right, not a problem. We're pretty flexible and as a number of legislators have already expressed, very pleased to have you here today. First on the agenda for today is uh, Audrey Arquin, I see I probably already started butchering names. Uh, I apologize, uh, from Central High School. Mr. Arquin, please. Thank you, Chair Dabney and members of the Education Finance Committee. Um, my name is Audrey Arquin. I'm a senior at Central High School and a representative of Congressional District 4 on the Minnesota Youth Council. Two years ago, I sat in front of this very committee to open session and detailed the disparities between school districts in suburban schools and my school district in St. Paul, as well as those between white students and students of color inside my own district. Now, two years later, after living through a life-threatening pandemic and what seems like a lifetime of racial and social injustice, those disparities have only worsened. One of the biggest issues I see in my day-to-day -day school life is the increase in end-school academic segregation. This issue comes up a lot of the legislature and specifically talks about the lack of diversity in higher level courses. Pre-pandemic, there used to be around three to four students of color in many of my higher level classes. Today, I find it very often that I'm the only one. When speaking with classmates and peers, I hear many reasons for them dropping out of these courses. From the inability to learn correctly through the pandemic and distance learning, but also an inability to focus on learning due to the constraints of the outside world such as having to teach siblings, working extra shifts, or strife and violence disrupting their learning environments. However, one of the biggest reasons I hear over and over again is that we are putting extra strain on our students of color by forcing them to be confronted by the outside world. Yesterday was yet another reminder that the education of students of color across this nation is under attack. And when we talk about the disparities in our classrooms, it is not just the lack of academic achievement. It also must be recognized that our systemic systems of oppression mentally and physically drain students of color. 
Over the past year, as outside events have bled more and more into classrooms, students of color are not only forced to learn the material, but have to bear the burden of teaching their peers and teachers how to treat them with respect and accurately represent their narratives and stories. This is compounded by an overall sense of instability and inaction inside of our student body. Students, especially high schoolers, are not naive. We understand the nature of our schools and our environment around us and how broken it is. We also know that throughout the years, our school administration, legislative bodies, and elected officials have failed to make meaningful change in our day-to-day -day lives. This once again forces students, specifically students of color, to take time and action to combat issues like the lack of mental health support, food insecurity, and in-school segregation. This is detrimental to our education. If a student has to spend all day fighting for the ability to learn equitably, we can't spend any effort actually learning our material. So how do we fix these issues and how do we best support our students? In my experience and in my eyes, the number one solution is ensuring that our staff and teaching body is representative of our student body. Over the past 10 years, as a student in schools that are majority students of color and in a district that is majority students of color, I've only ever had two teachers of color. That is plain and simply wrong. From my experience, teachers of color have a massive impact on ensuring success for students of color. At the elementary school level, teachers of color support their students as, like, as role models and leaders. And as we transition into middle school and high schools, they lift the burden on educating our peers about racism and culture. Teachers of color help create an environment in which students of color feel supported and can focus on their academics instead of trying to fix their school systems. It should be proof enough that in my school, the higher level and accelerated classes with the most students of color are the ones taught by teachers of color. We not only need to increase our teachers of color, but we also need to do a better job of supporting them. Teachers of color on a daily basis have to make subtle changes to who they authentically are, from their hair, speech, demeanor, dress, and emotional response, in order to make white administration, staff, students, parents, and community members more comfortable. If we aren't allowing teachers of color to authentically show up in the classrooms and spaces where they have even a little bit of power, how are we going to expect students of color to authentically show up in spaces where they have none? There are so many more actions we can take from ensuring culturally competent curriculum to fully funding extracurricular programs and more. But in my eyes and experience, the most influential change are in the ones leading our classrooms. The state of Minnesota has a sad history of underserving our communities of color, and that starts inside of our school system. For the past two years, we've seen some of the biggest educational disparities in our nation continue to grow. It's time to reckon with that history and start to change the trajectory for so many students across our state. Thank you, and I yield my time to the chair. Ms. Harquin, thank you so much for returning to the committee uh, with, with uh, fresh, fresh insights uh, over a heck of a two years in public education. So thank you. Next uh, on, on the list of students is Naisha Finn from the Minnesota Valley Area Learning Center in Montevideo. Ms. Finn, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Chair Javney and members of the committee, thank you for letting me speak today. My name is Nisha Finn and I attend the Minnesota Valley Area Learning Center in Montevideo. I was taken out of the public school system when, to be homeschooled in 2007. In 2018, I went back to the public school as a ninth grader because I was held back. When the school year started, I had a really hard time adjusting and ended up in the hospital two times in the next two months for struggling with my mental health. My school counselor told me it, was, it would be best if I started attending the Minnesota Valley Area Learning Center in Montevideo. At first, I, I didn't like the idea, but I soon learned that I, I was going to like it. At first, I was shy and quiet. I didn't talk to anyone and I tried not to be noticed. After a month, I got more comfortable and made friends. My mental health was and continues to be a struggle. I eventually stopped coming to school, but my sophomore year, I came back with a fresh start and an open mind. The ALC is important to me because it has helped me continue my educational journey when I thought I, I would not be able to. It has helped me become the person I have always wanted to be. I enjoy the small class sizes, the family environment, and the one-on-one -on -one learning. My, my favorite subject is literature because I really like reading. My role as a 
Mapstar's day officer is to be a leader to my peers, promote Mapstar's, and be an advocate for alternative education. Mapstar's has helped me bring awareness to alternative programs and creates a place for students to fulfill their potential as leaders. Mapstar's has helped me become a better leader in my community, a better public speaker, an advocate for myself and others and become a better person in general, which was confirmed last year when I was named Student of the Year by Minnesota um, Association of Alternative Programs. I took a CNA class part this past semester that was offered at my school at the local community college, which sparked my interest in pursuing a nursing career. I plan on attending Bemidji State University for nursing in the fall, of 2022 after I graduate. Thank you, Chair Davney and the committee members for letting me talk today. I'm willing to answer any questions at this time. Ms. Finn, thank you so much for uh, sharing your story and your persistence. And I have to also say thank you so much for going into the healthcare field at a time where when we need uh, more people going into those fields. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Isla McIntosh from the Austin Area Learning Center. Ms. McIntosh. Um, Good morning. Welcome. You can take off the mask. Okay. Chair Daphne and members of the committee. My name is Isla McIntosh. I'm a junior at Austin Area Learning Center. I ran for state officer because I wanted everyone to know how the ALC has helped me and how it has made a difference in so many lives. It just came on. Okay. I have never enjoyed going to school. I struggled to have good grades, interact with people, and to make friends until I joined the ALC, where my confidence level has risen dramatically. My grades went up for mostly Ds and Fs to As and Bs. I started actually talking in class and I'm learning to enjoy getting up in the morning to, to go to school. This is because my teachers take the time and help their students and care about us kind of like we're their kids. The teachers caring about us helps me actually care about school and makes me want to learn. I know that if I needed help with anything, they are here. And I know I can count on my teachers and classmates for almost everything without judging me. The smaller classrooms help my anxiety not be so bad and makes it easier for me to talk in class. In smaller classrooms, I'm able to participate and make new friends. From my personal experience in the ALC, I can trust the people around me in just about anything because if they needed to talk about anything, I would be there for them no matter who they are because I know that they would do the same for me. Okay. Like many alternative schools, the ALC my school has a bad reputation for being the place where they stick the bad kids or troubled kids. Mainstream students will walk down the hallway and look into the classrooms and make fun of us. When we just want to learn and be who we are. And the support of the classmates, they can be who they are. They don't have to hide or stay to themselves. 
the ALC in my school has been defined for something that we are not. The slow people class, the place they send the bad kids, and so many other things. In fact, the ALC is a safe place for students to learn. It might take a bit longer and we might go about things in a different way, but we master the same standards that the students do in the actual high school. The ALC is a place where students can find support from their peers and not be judged, regardless of language, academic abilities, race, gender, or sexuality. Or if you're like me and terrified to talk in front of groups, we have all been there and we understand how scary public speaking can be. If I'm being honest, I would 100% be back online by now. And I would still be failing all my classes if I hadn't found the Austin Area Learning Center and MapStars. Talking to you guys today has been a huge step for me overcoming my worst fear like this. This is my worst nightmare. I'm just glad I have the support from my teachers, my family, and my friends, and also my classmates. So I know that if I failed, they would help make me feel better and say there are other opportunities to face your fears and have the support that I have. And if anyone else here says so much about how the ALC can help even the quietest people come out of their shell. Overall, the ALC is by far the best decision I've ever made. And I think everyone should see and support how truly great it is. Open to questions. Thank you. I'm open to questions. Ms. McIntosh, thank you so much for that. Uh, powerful testimony about uh, your and your willingness to share so articulately your, your personal journey and some of your hopes. Uh, very much appreciate that and be assured that uh, you've got a room full of people here who uh, speak in public all the time and uh, are as nervous uh, every time we do it uh, as you may be. So uh, welcome welcome to the, the Nervous Public Speaker Club, uh, but thank you for, for taking time with us today. Next, uh, on, we will hear from Kaylee Johnson, a Voyageurs Expeditionary School student from Bemidji. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson. Hi, Chair Daphne and members of the committee. My name is Kaylee Johnson and I attend Voyagers Expeditionary High School. I'm from the Red Lake Indian Reservation and I come from a very traditional background. Um, I like to work hard to achieve my new goals I bring for my people and I like to set a role model for my peers and my people. I have courage and more opportunities from MAP stars. MAP helped me a lot to come out of my shell, like not be an outcast anymore and be more confident in myself. Attending a alternative school has helped me with my grades because we get more hands-on learning from our teachers and staff. We are like a family at these type of small schools. Alternative education can help you build for your future and you get more experience outside in the real world helping people. And some issues at my school are access to more activities like sports, art, music, like we need more funding for it. And Another issue is mental health that gets, you, you guys know, but yeah, for the students, families and staff, that's a big problem nowadays because of COVID. And at my school at Voyagers, most of the kids here are Native American. And yeah, thanks for listening to me.
if, and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Johnson. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, next student we'll be hear, hearing from is Charlie Schmidt from Washburn High School in Minneapolis. Mr. Schmidt, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Hello, my name is Charlie Schmidt. I'm a sophomore here representing the Minnesota Youth Council, Minnesota Public Schools, uh, specifically Washburn High School. I'd like to thank Chair Daphne and the rest of the committee for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Before I start, I'd like to say that much of this testimony is based on experience or ideas from students at Washburn High School. When students think about graduation, they are only thinking about one thing, college. Schools teach us that essentially the only path forward in life is college or some type of trade school. It is heavily implied through our, throughout our schooling experience that college or failure are the only options. Given these options, most students are inclined to go for the college option. The main problem they are facing here is money. The typical tuition for the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is about $17,000 a year. This figure is just for the U of M. Obviously, there are various other schools kids may end up going to, but this is just the underlying problem for almost every kid in high school. How will we pay for college? Students who take who take out student loans have an interest rate on their loan, which can make it at times impossible to pay off. My parents, who are in their 40s, are still paying off their student loans after attending college 20 years ago at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which they had reciprocity at. And college is even more expensive now. We must reduce the amount of money students pay for a higher education to make it more equitable for all. Students also don't feel like they're well-versed in just being an adult. Only 2% of what you learn in school is actually applicable to real life. We need required courses that can teach us that level of independence and financial freedom that school just doesn't teach us, such as required classes on personal finance, even just little lessons built into the curriculum of how to get a job, how to do taxes, how to buy or rent a home, et cetera, could be a huge help to students later in life. Kids feel like they need a lot of assistance in the post-secondary education process as well, as a lot of students aren't well-versed in the variety of options available to them. Luckily, my school has a college and career center that helps kids understand options and what life may look like one to two years after high school. The problem is the college and career center is only staffed by two people for a high school of 1600. And obviously they can't help all of them. We need systems like this to help kids prepare for life after high school. Obviously there are a lot of things students re need right now, but the most important among them is more school counselors. Right now, my school, Washburn High School has four school counselors for 1600 kids. That's a one to 400 ratio. Counselors help guide students through high school and help them on the path forward in life, whether that be off to college or something completely different. More counselors would allow kids to be able to accurately plan their futures and it would allow students to form actual connections with the counselors. Kids also need more mental health support. We are currently going through the most stressful time in our lives in high school. Now we have to tackle a global pandemic and school closures with a year of online school, plus a summer of riots for even just yesterday, a 15 year old was shot and killed in its own high school, just five miles from where I currently attend school. We need to make sure kids have good mental well-being to make sure they are getting the education they deserve. We need access to therapists for all students to reduce mental health disorders and help make sure students can recover from these stressful times by simply being able to talk their problems out. As someone who has been in therapy for almost two years now, I can say that it's a very helpful experience and has greatly reduced stress in my life. Lastly, we need to make sure that we have a good and equitable staff at all schools. In all my years of schooling, nearly every teacher I've had has been white, and the Minneapolis Public Schools are some of the most diverse schools in the state. We need more BIPOC teachers in schools to enrich everyone's learning by having a diverse set of teachers who may expose us to different views not seen by others. We also need to increase teacher pay in general, because right now, we barely have enough teachers to staff our classrooms. Currently, if we have a teacher who isn't doing their job at all, we can't really do anything about it. We can't put them on leave, move them, or fire them because we just don't have enough staff to fill the vacant spot. We have an understaffed office because no one really wants to work. And we see similar situations like this all across the state. The solution to this is just pay our teachers more so they have a living wage and are compelled to work for the public schools instead of regretting not choosing another school or private institution that pays them more. Obviously, this is big ask, and no one expects this change to happen overnight. Just mentioning this to draw attention to the broader issues of the lack of teacher resources. I know I spoke about a lot of issues today, and I know that there's all under consideration at different levels of government. So I hope you take my testimony into account when considering these issues. Thank you all for your attention and time today, and I yield my time to the chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Schmidt. Appreciate hearing your voice today. Next student uh, is Sarah Mackey from Grand Rapids High School in, well, Grand Rapids. Ms. Mackey, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. 
I am Sarah Mackey. I am a senior at Grand Rapids High School. Grand Rapids High School is a school of approximately 1,200 students. We are the only school north of the metro that provides inner baccalaureate classes. We also provide the opportunity for juniors and seniors to go post-secondary to complete some college courses while they're still in high school. Within speaking to students at my school, we feel that in order to prepare for life after graduation, we need the support from staff such as counselors and teachers to, to prepare us for the world that awaits us outside of the formal learning center. And support, we need them to support other options than college and universities after graduation. We feel that the most urgent things for us to be provided by our school community is that we're taught life skills for the real world that don't have anything to do with formal education, such, such as the teaching classes such as home ec, and bring back classes in high schools that provide and prepare for the trades and not just college. And this could include building houses for Habitat for Humanity. And I am open to questions and yield my time to the chair. Thank you, Ms. Mackey. Appreciate your uh, joining us today. Members, any questions uh, or reflections uh, for or on the student's testimony? If you, if you wish to participate, please uh, use the raise your hand function. Representative Thompson. Yes, Chair. Um, my heart goes out to uh, the young man who lost his life over in Richfield. It's actually a friend of mine, uh, Cortez. That was his son, a good friend of mine, who, who, who his son was the one who lost his life uh, yesterday. Uh, I also wanted to share our chair, our kids, our kids had a, a, a district-wide walkout here in St. Paul uh, just two weeks ago, organized by the Minnesota teen activists, uh, Jerome Treadwell. Mm -hmm. And they were screaming something, screaming something to us. It's our job to listen to them, to actually react, do something with uh, our, our youth here. These are our babies that we're talking about. There's no such thing as uh, somebody else's kids. These are all of our kids. Uh, and so we highlight, in our, in our movement, we highlight this, uh, there's a lot of crime. There's a lot of crime, especially in St. Paul. It's carjackings and gun violence. Some of the, some of the stuff is being perpetrated by our youth. They're screaming something. They're screaming to us. Like they're screaming to us right now. And I just heard uh, one of the young men talk about behavioral health, mental health specialists. I just shared this in the last committee I was in. These kids are like, you, you, there has to be something going on up here. You just uh, bold enough to walk up to somebody with a gun and carjack them and ask for their car key, right? But here we have an opportunity to stop our kids and to save our kids from getting into this vicious cycle of, of being a part of the criminal justice system, being a part of the judicial system. And they're asking, they're asking like right now, while, we, while I'm listening, I've heard everything these kids have said. They're asking us right now to hear them out and to act before they react. Because what we're seeing right now is this, this, is, this is a huge plan. Actually, actually, charity, we, we hear this all the time. On, I mean, these these are political talking points when we talk about crime. Like crime has become in my community, it's come a, become a, a a talking point for people who have no idea how to fix the crime in our community. But these babies here today are actually like they're not involved in any of this stuff right now. But they can easily be involved. You know, this prison prison to uh, school to prison pipeline is real. Our kids are being sized up for jumpsuits right now at the age of six years old. So I just wanted to like make sure that we hear these children and actually do something. That's our job to do something. This is our future and I hope that we invest wisely. And we're gonna return on investment, promise you. We are all gonna be 65 years old one day. These kids are gonna be our future. So we'll get a very good return on our investment. We're not losing anything by actually hearing them out, listening to them and acting. 
And I just want to say thank you. I just wanted to make that comment because I listen to the children all the time and they're actually screaming, they're hurting. And Chair, even, even in, 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 in this particular committee, I shared the same sentiment last year when the state was closed down. I said, our community is gonna be in an epidemic of crime. As soon as the state opens back up, our kids are gonna be really good. And, and I knew it, this is what was gonna happen. And now this is not, we figure out ways to lock them up. We figure out ways to, 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 to incarcerate them. That's, that's the key to everything, but that's not working. We figure out ways to fully fund some of the things that these kids are asking us for. Honestly, and that's not a, this is not a me, I have a 12 year old kid you know, who, who, who actually would benefit from us making the right decisions. You know, a lot of times well-intended legislation harms my community. They will say, thank you so much, Chair, and let me say that. Thank you, Representative Thompson. Representative Joaquin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank again the students that came to sp speak today and share their stories. Um, it's hard to do. I know that I share, <laughs> share Daphne's sentiment of always getting nervous before I speak in public as well, and I just wanted to um, point out and thank uh, Representative Thompson. You're right. We failed somewhere as adults in the room to figure out how to show kids there's other opportunities out there, um, and I hear that from students in here today too about how they want those opportunities and options and having the options of smaller class sizes. I heard a lot through the ALCs. My husband I used to teach at an ALC and teaches in a smaller program and nothing can replace those connections with smaller programs and building those relationships with students. And if there is a way we could do anything at this point, was to be would be to replicate those smaller class sizes. I was reflecting on when our children who all graduated from college um, were going through elementary, there was extra money in K through three to have another set of hands in the classroom. And having two adults in a classroom made all the difference. Um, and those that should be part of our discussion as well. And those opportunities beyond um, secondary, beyond high school, don't always look the same for everyone. And we have to provide different options for our students as they move forward. Um, and then just to thank the students for your perseverance and your parents and your teachers and your communities as we went through this global pandemic. Um, I just wanna remind folks, you know, there was a short time where we had to close to pivot to distance learning, but our schools were still trying the best they could to provide education and supports and, and even nutrition to our students during this during the time of the pandemic. and. And um, it really, I think you succeeding as you have and what you've shared with us today, students, just shows the perseverance that you have. And I wish you the best of luck in the future. And um, everyone's right. We need to listen more to what our students are saying and what they need. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Joachim. Representative Sandsteed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to say a very special thank you to all of the students for your courage in coming and uh, addressing our committee today. Um, many of the things you said resonated with me as an educator myself. One of the things that I really um, would like to hear a little bit more about if any of you have thoughts, uh, many of you talked about mental health, the need for mental health supports, not only for students, but also for staff. And thank you so much for recognizing that and mentioning that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious because we heard from students from ALCs to traditional types of settings. What would that look like for our students? What would they recommend? Maybe what services do they currently have in place? And from their perspective, what would be helpful? Um, certainly I'm seeing a need in, in the school systems for more public health or mental health supports. Um, but I think it would be really meaningful to hear that from the students. Students, uh, if you wish to respond, uh, would you please use the raise your hand function on, this, on Zoom, uh, and I'll be glad to call on any of you. Mr. Schmidt, please. Yeah, so I think that's a great question. Oh, wait. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's a great question of like how specifically you go at this. Um, currently at my school, Washburn, we have a school-based clinic. So basically just a clinic where students can go and get this kind of support. Um, 
various other types of things, not just mental health, but we have um, in-school therapists where you can register to get free therapy um, just from the school and you don't have to go anywhere outside of school to get to. So transportation's easy, it's free, and it's just easy to talk about your issues. So I mentioned this a little in my testimony, but this is kind of at least what I've been leaning towards and what I've heard other kids have been leaning towards because it's just such a simple, well, not as such a simple, but it's such a simple thing for students to do once that resource is there, the problem is making that resource widely available. So free therapists basically in schools in some sort of clinic type thing, I think is the most helpful solution. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Other students, uh, do you wish to respond? Oh, Representative Sandstein. I, I appreciate that answer so much. And um, I think what we're hearing is accessibility, you know, just genuine accessibility to our students. And the school setting is a great place for that. Anybody else would be, I'd love to hear any other responses. Any other students wish to respond? It represents it. It looks like we're back to the nervous speaking in front of groups. Perfectly. Uh, Just a, a very heartfelt thank you to all of our students for their courage today. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you to the students for um, your thoughts and your testimony. So one of the questions that I have as, a, as an educator, as well as a coach and now a business person who helps people transition and reach their potential. One, one of the things that I'm curious about is as to our student leaders, when do you see the transitioning happening between uh, the adults and, and some of the things that adults are trying to do to help you get through and when the accountability starts to shift in your own lives? When do you, uh, you know, is, it, is that happening in high school? Are you feeling the confidence to reach those potentials? Uh, we certainly have lots of things as, as teachers and adults, we try to make decisions for our students, but ultimately our goal is to teach that next generation of citizens and, and really turn the reins over. So I'm curious about how you see that transition in your own lives and in your peers, and when you see taking over those adult responsibilities and being able to grow to those next levels and how we can help you with that. Any of the students wish to respond? I, I think Representative Krisha is, is uh, echoing some of the conversation that you all brought to the committee today. Mr. Schmidt. I feel I feel bad going again because I don't know. I don't know who's left on here. So I apologize if anyone else wanted a chance to talk. But um, yeah, so the shift in responsibilities really, I think a lot of kids aren't, I mean, biggest responsibility we see shifting is obviously driving. Like when you're 16, that's like the big, that's the big adult thing that people get to do as a kid. That's like the only adult thing. And then most people won't even turn 18 until they're halfway through the school year and then they can't vote. So once you can vote, that's kind of like an as an adult thing. And a lot of students take pride in that. But I think really students aren't seeing like that transition into adult life or kind of like into adult responsibilities until they're just done with high school and they're out on their own. And they're really just not experiencing that until they're essentially pushed off a bridge and forced to swim. Um, and there's ways to help with that, obviously. I mentioned in my testimony, just some kind of required courses that can help teach us that level of independence or financial freedom that we need to survive in the real world because we're not being taught that now. So like, I don't know how to do anything. <laughs> and so I think that would be the most useful solution. Any, thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Any follow-up, Representative Krisha? No, I, I appreciate the, well, yes, I, I guess I'm, I'm doing follow-up, so thank you. Um, I appreciate the answer. And I, I guess the question that I would just raise out there is, I, I understand the, the age markers, the driving and the, um, the, the voting and, and some of those that come with it, but 
you know, for many students that I work with in child protection and many students that come out of families that are dysfunctional or broken or are living through chronic uh, chemical dependencies, these students are forced and these children many times, even at the age of nine or 10 or younger, are forced to grow up into adult roles much quicker. And, and so sometimes I just wonder to myself as I look at my own children of, you know, how we can help those because the, the reality is we as, as adults can't be there for you all the time. And we're going to have to turn this over and these problems that we're facing in our schools, whether they're vaping or, or you know, poor achievement levels and all that, we're, we're going to have to make this a collective problem that we share between the adults and the students. So I, I guess I would just offer it up to that, that, you know, I, I, I'll just say it bluntly, I would like the students to have more confidence to start to grab the accountability and take their lives and reach their potential and not just weren't wait for the calendar to turn 18. Thank you. It, it looks like uh, you, you've sparked a couple of more students to participate. So thank you for that, Representative Krisha. Ms. Johnson, thank you for your patience. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't like find the button to raise your hand. <laughs> but no I was gonna say uh, the first que question you guys asked that I feel like we need more resources in school because some kids can't get that out of school with like, maybe they, they don't have their parents around or like no close family to get that help from them is what I was trying to say. Yeah. All right, thank you. Ms. Mackey, thank you. I think that we don't really learn within the school system of how we can become adults until we're going into a college and that's kind of like where our independence really starts because most of us don't turn 18, so we can't vote and we're not necessarily heard by decision makers if we don't have the power to vote. So I feel like changing that setting within the school of that their decision makers are here to serve us even though we can't vote so the education piece of what decision makers can really do for us coming into the school will help us gain our independence. Thank you for that. Any other questions from members? Representative Thompson. Um, to uh, Sarah, was it Sarah Mackey who just spoke? Mm -hmm. You are very powerful. Your voice is very powerful. You matter. And if you feel like the, the decision makers aren't listening to you, my advice to you would be to organize, strategize, and mobilize the youth. And then they'll listen to you all. You come as a, like a, that's, that's a true statement. You are definitely my future. You are my future. And everybody is in this body, you are their future also. And so your voice is very powerful. I can speak for every last one of my colleagues. We hear you loud and clear. I know I do. <clears throat> I know Chair Dabney does. And everybody on this call, in any kind of way, any kind of way that we can actually help, I'm all for that. Let's attack the problem. Let's attack the problem. We can do enough attacking people. People will mess up all the time, but let's attack the problem. Right now, my kid, uh, Chair Dabney, my kid, my kid's an honor roll student. He brought three Fs home this week. Like, this, like, my kid brought three Fs home. So it's like school is failing in my household right now. You know, and so I want to figure it out. And so this is refreshing for me to hear um, this young lady, Sarah Mackey, say these are the problems. Now we're in a position to go back and try to figure it out. And so I'm honored to be a part of not only this, this committee, I'm honored to be able to hear your voice, um, Sarah, and the rest of the young people here. Thank you. But that would be my advice, honestly. Organize, strategize, and mobilize. That's how you'll be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Thompson. With that, members, uh, I would like to again thank uh, Audrey Arquin, 
Nesha Finn, Isla McIntosh, Kaylee, Kayla, Kaylee, excuse me, Johnson, Charlie Schmidt, and Sarah Mackey, all for coming today and testifying before us and bringing uh, students to the center of this committee's deliberations. Very much appreciate that. Uh, thank you to the adults who helped organize that. Uh, Ms. Hosh, I see you, uh, and, and the others, uh, Ms., Ms. Henderson. Uh, members uh, will be meeting again tomorrow and uh, kind of taking from some of the themes that were struck here today, tomorrow, the focus will be on the issues around mental health for both students and staff in our public schools currently. Uh, everyone will have the materials for the next meeting by the end of today, and we'll have a full week of hearings next week. So members with that, the committee is adjourned. Thank you for your time. Best for the rest of your day. Thank you.